And there we are. So yeah, welcome if you've been waiting um, to the next installment of the reading group on Wittgenstein. First question as well for you guys is um, what section are we up to? <laughs> You were the only person in your last uh, reading group video. I know, and so and so, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you want to go back um, and do together anything that I covered. Yeah, exactly. That's your call. Okay. Oh, I I had it in the other tab. <laughs> I had this. It started playing. So you said you said to me you were the only person in the other um, reading group, and then I said. Yeah, I know. And then the other tabs are playing, and I heard you say that again. And I was like, "Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's some linguistic confusion for you." Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let me see if I can find out. Then um, I should have probably done this before, but that's the way it is. Uh, Wittgenstein reading group episode three was the last one. Yep. If you want to redo it, it's fine. I didn't get to watch your last video, I'm afraid. Okay, let's see. But I'm also happy just pressing on. Have you read Hegel or Heidegger? You... <laughs> As a matter of principle, I don't read Hegel. Uh, I've, re I've read uh, some Heidegger. I'm not an expert on, in Heidegger by any means. Yeah, there were influences on Wittgenstein, right? Yeah, so part of the same trend, I, I believe. To a degree, I think there's a lot of <clears throat> so. So Wittgenstein grew up in, um, like, in high Viennese culture because his parents were very wealthy, and he was not given an orthodox education as well because his his father sort of had had an idea in mind for his kids' education, um, uh, you know, that might make them kind of exceptional people. And but but his elder his elder brothers ended up actually <laughs> committing okay. suicide as a result of pe people hypothesize you know why but some some people speculate as a result of um, some of those influences from you know the expectations and stuff mm -hmm. and then so Wittgenstein was allowed to sort of have a more ordinary education so in the sense that he went to the real school in Linz and stuff like that um and wasn't just homeschooled but he had but he had had some homeschooling um as well and i think in, t in terms of the big influence of, in influences on him intellectually um he read schopenhauer when he was younger also interestingly um otto weininger um, and his sex and character, which Otto Weininger, who was described by Hitler as the only good Jew, because he said that um, Jews should basically, you know, like kill themselves. And he has this r really weird um, characterization of, I don't, I don't know, the way that people think, the differences between men and women and races and stuff like that. Just very, it, it's like a really weird book. But apparently R Wittgenstein read that when he was a bit younger. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of other stuff. So there's a book called The Principles of Mechanics um, by Werner Hertz, who was a, a physicist. And I think Wittgenstein read that before he went to Manchester to become an aeronaut, for example. And that talks about that. There's a bit in that about um, like what is a force, right? And I think Hertz's approach to it isn't to um, kind of dig deeper and deeper but i think there's a, there's a very specific quote where it's like well when when you kind of shift the perspective that you look at it through you realize that you're sort of asking a, a kind of misguided question you'll cease to ask questions once you reframe it in this light and some uh, like ray ray monk one of wittgenstein's biographers has said well like stuff like that was an influence but then um then he went to manchester to study um and while he was there and doing some some more mathematical based stuff he got interested in the discussion around the foundations of mathematics um went and talked to Gottlob Frege who was a mathematician and philosopher and Frege recommended that he go to Cambridge and talk to Russell so then he went and talked to Russell Russell sort of what I, I mean there's, there's also a lot of apocrypha sort of around apocryphal stories around um what goes on, particularly when whenever Bertrand Russell's involved, like there's so many right. weird stories, right? That, but yeah, because Russell sort of was very connected to a lot of these historical people and events and stuff. But I think he embellished a lot of these stories. Um, mm -hmm. 
but then the idea is so Wittgenstein sort of ended up hanging around in Cambridge um, for a while. I think it was two or three years into his undergraduate degree that um, he started going to Norway for a while and um, he'd spend time in Norway and people like G. Moore would, you know, go over there and spend a bit of time with him. Um, and also this guy called David Pinson. So uh, Wittgenstein was gay um, and David Pinson was one of his like first first lovers. And then, and then you have um, the First World War happened and he signed up to join the Austrian army. And uh, so the, a lot of the Tractatus, the, the second half was written while he was in the trenches in the army. Um, and then he was a prisoner of war towards the end of the war after um, obviously Austria-Hungary, you know, didn't do too well in World War One. So then he was in an Italian prisoner of war camp and he wrote the end part of the Tractatus then. Um, and he was in, in contact with... It, through letters with Bertrand Russell and uh, and uh, Main John Maynard Keynes in Cambridge and stuff like that, and that you know they were kind of trying to support him, and he wanted to get the Tractatus published then after that, and he, and he had issues getting it published. Um, I can't remember exactly what happened to get him out of the out of the camp, but I, I don't want to go fully into into his biography and everything. But then you know he ends up basically becoming a school teacher for a while. <laughs> Then um, he, the Tractatus ends up being published during this time. Um, as the Tractatus is published, it's interpreted by a group of philosophers in Vienna to be sort of doing away with all of metaphysics, you know, the logical positivists. And Wittgenstein's like, well, that's not what I quite meant. Wittgenstein goes through a kind of Kantian phase uh, as like a sort of it, interested in the phenomenology of experience and trying to figure out the way the world is off of that. Um, then he's convinced to come back to Cambridge, uh, does as a lecturer, takes the chair that was going to be given to Susan Stebbing. Um, interesting thing there, if, pe if people are interested in like her, her influences on public philosophy and critical thinking. And then when he's when he's back in Cambridge, you know, there's a bunch more stuff that happens, um, you know, including World War II. But the, the idea is his, his thought changes. Uh, and one key moment is this economist who he used to like to talk to doing this, I think. And he says, well, what proposition does this express? Right. Um, and Wittgenstein, I think set, said in one of his diaries that this sort of, he realized, you know, language, he, he'd initially supposed in the Tractatus along with Russell and Frege that um, language's function is to express propositions. Right. And, uh, and that was when he realized, well, language does a whole lot more than, than just that. And then, I think it initially through philosophy of mathematics, he began to talk about um, language games. And then in a series of his lectures, there were like the blue and the brown books published by his students based on based on their notes. And one of them was just his students notes, the blue book, I think. And then the brown book was also um, him sort of editing things a bit together. And then, you know, some more time he ends up publishing, he ends up writing the philosophical investigations, puts it together. Um, after after a bit more time, I mean, there's there's loads more events and anecdotes and things going on. Like like World War Two, he published a paper uh, with some doctors on um, on shock. So a lot of research from World War One was about shock, and uh, Wittgenstein with the with the people that he was working with sort of came to find that there was a lot of confusion around, you know, a lot of degenerate research programs basically around shock because it was being used inappropriately for a bunch of different things where there was actually, you know, a, a wide variety of differences between these individual cases. Um, mm. Anyway, he, he, he public, publishes the philosophical investigations, um, lives a bit more, goes to um, Ireland. He go, goes to America as well to see, uh, to Cornell for a bit to see his, uh, one of his students, uh, Norman Malcolm focuses on a few other questions around skepticism and philosophy of mind and philosophy of color as well. So he publishes something called or, or writes something called uncertainty, like right towards the end of his life and also something on the philosophy of color um, and then dies of cancer and then was uh, buried as a Catholic. He was given the Catholic final rites because of his comments about religion to friends in his personal group. So Elizabeth Anscombe, who was a Catholic, was one of his students. And, you know, he died in quite close connection to her. And so, and, and this um, 
this Catholic priest in Cambridge who he wanted to talk to. And he said, you know, make sure it's not someone who's into philosophy. Like he just wanted to talk about religion, not uh, not, not like reasons for believing in God's existence or whatever. So, so they decided to give him a proper Catholic burial then at the end of his life. And um, that is a short summary of his biography for those who want to be up to speed. But just a note on the relationship to Heidegger and Hegel. There's a great book called The Time of the, Time of the Magicians uh, that sort of just discusses puts him in the context with them um without making strong claims about influence um although obviously there's some sort of response to contemporary philosophical uh trends um we, we probably should dive in i would at some point love to yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. the influence of william james and wittgenstein but that's uh yeah as well. yeah another another conversation Yes. Um, thank okay, you, Nathan, so for that, I'm thinking uh, it's around. Oh, sorry. Biographical sorry. sketch, and thanks again for the uh, book recommendation. So, so um, I would say probably around section 23 might be a good place to kick off. And okay. and if we're going to do this, if we if we do this more consistently, like once a month, um, then hopefully if, if people are watching along and stuff then we'll be able to make a bit of progress but i don't know yeah. i don't know how much we're going to make per so we're looping back to the beginning then because this is what you did last time uh, right yeah loop it loop back to section 23 i guess Got it. and uh uh and we'll see how far we get so okay um i'll, I'll stop reading then just at section 23 and we can comment on each section as we go but how many kinds of sentence are there say assertion question and command there are countless kinds countless different kinds of use of all these things we call signs words sentences and this diversity is not something fixed given once for all but new types of language new language games as we may say come into existence and others become obsolete and get forgotten we can get a rough picture of this from the changes in mathematics the word language game is used here to emphasize the fact that the speaking of language is part of an activity or of a form of life. Consider the variety of language games in the following examples and in others, giving orders and acting on them, describing an object by its appearance or by its measurements, constructing an object from a description, a drawing, reporting an event, speculating about an event, forming and testing a hypothesis, presenting the result of an experiment in tables and diagrams, making up a story and reading one, acting in a play, singing rounds, guessing riddles, cracking a joke, telling one, solving a problem in applied arithmetic, translating from one language into another, requesting, thanking, cursing, greeting, praying. It is interesting to compare the diversity of the tools of language and of the ways they are used, the diversity of kinds of word and sentence with what logicians have said about the structure of language, this includes the author of the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Uh, so I don't know if I, if there's anything anyone wants to say. Sick on burn that. Wittgenstein on <laughs> Wittgenstein. <laughs> I imagine Cyril reading this and like, wait, I can fix that. <laughs> it's like, no, there are five. Yeah, I, I guess uh, to provide a bit a bit of commentary. Um, so, so so far what's gone on is you know there's been this kind of excursus on on well Wittgenstein sort of stipulated for us a couple of potential language games and told us how things also told us a story about how things might go according to you know the previous view that he held um and then at this point he's sort of had a bit of a revelation that um that view of language as a kind of um logical calculus or something you know that that represents um that represents states of affairs in the world. You know, there's kind of like a to atomic facts or something and language corresponds to the way that those atomic facts are in this kind of isomorphic relationship where language has to reflect that and it all builds up in this nice logical way. Um, it doesn't actually reflect the the thing that it's trying to describe, right? The thing that we're trying to describe is, is language as we encounter it in our life. And that isn't just expressing truth out propositions. I mean, uh, there's all this other stuff and you know in that list that that language does and a, a complete philosophy of language i suppose should encompass all of that my um how i would sort of paraphrase wittgenstein's response to that question so how many kinds of sentences are there right um and uh is that that's like asking how many kinds of things can you do 
Right. That the, yeah, cons- yeah. the, the, the language that can, you know, there aren't like five functions of language or one function of language or like uh, things like that. But that language, there can be as many kinds of ways of using words as there is kinds of things that anyone can do because it's not this, you know, language isn't something special. Uh, it isn't something different from the rest of ways of describing the behavior of people. Um, and so, sure, you can break things into categories and group things. Uh, But the idea that you are going to come up with a set of categories that will exhaust all the sorts of things a person can do is just silly. (laughs) Do you want to say anything, Anam? Or if you don't, um, do you want to read section 24? I have no idea if you've even got the text, by the way. If you don't, I can... I think I have the text, but I was looking for the page number. Uh... Oh, uh, well, section 24... So Wittgenstein's writing is in, like, sections, right? So... um, if you go to section 24, that's where we're at, but the page number might differ by, um, you know, like version or whatever that you're in. It, it shouldn't be too far in though. It's only like, it's only 15 pages, something in my. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, oh, well, 30 pages. I think they're double um, numbered. Yeah. But 24. Okay. Um, no, uh, but uh, I'll look for that. Yeah, no problem. I, I can read uh, 24 if you want. Um, I'm ready to read the next section. Yeah, feel free to go. Yeah. Although I hate to... I'm happy giving an arm a second to go find it if we want him to be able to follow along. Um, Yeah, yeah. You're muted. Maybe we should just contextualize. (laughs) I mean, is there anything worth saying about Austin and Searle with respect to this section? Um... That there there was an effort, there is an effort that comes post-Wittgenstein and under the influence of Wittgenstein to sort of group the... Uh, categorize the different ways that language operates upon a person or right right or thing that's not quite right it's the different kind of things that a person might use language to accomplish right uh, and it's, sometimes it's not always like this statement goes in this box or this box but like this statement does this at this level at this level at this level and i think it's interesting to think about what Wittgenstein would say about that my my sense is that he wouldn't he wouldn't like Searle in particulars <laughs> rigid breaking it down. I think he would really like what at the very end of Austin's lectures, he says that really all three effects sort of collapse into perlocutionary effects that everything ultimately is perlocutionary. And I think we consider it like that better. Like everything ultimately is you trying to bring about results through language for the, the you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to break down all the different Austin categories right now, but um, I, I think Wittgenstein would like the ultimate collapsing of that those distinctions into, um, again, just a kind of behavior and a behavior that is geared towards, you know, changing the world in some way to be as vague as possible. Um, uh, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, Nathan, if you want to comment on. For, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm no... Um... I'm not like an expert on all of these other things because they're they're also been been new to me in the past year. So I've not read um, how to do things with words, which is the the next sort of the thing awesome on my one. list. Um, but yeah, as far as my understanding of things goes, what my impression is, what Wittgenstein would say about it, I, I think he would probably be critical of the idea that there is this neat ca- categor- uh, categorization that could be offered. But then I also think it. I, I think maybe some of those same criticisms could almost be levied against him, but I think I think it's sort of the nature of just trying to talk about these things at all, right? Um, so, so for example, he's saying the word language game, which is, and, and he does talk about this in the uh, in the investigations. We'll get onto it. You know, someone could say to you, "You've done, you've." He says something to the effect of someone. Well, someone could say to you, um, "You know, you say language game, but you failed to tell us what the essence of a language game is, or something." And uh, how would I respond to that? But. Um, so may, maybe, you know, that would be a better way, when, when we get around to that, that would be a better way of um, letting the author respond himself to that kind sure, of criticism. Sure. But um, I do think it would it would be somewhere along the lines of, you know, like, they, well, this divi- division between um, illocutionary act and perlocutionary act or whatever, um, maybe, maybe falls down. Because I, I think the idea, the other thing I remember is, is about meanings, right? So there's the idea of, um natural meaning and speaker meaning that those are the way that things that so so natural meaning is uh on this is on the 
I forget whether this is Grice or Austin, but na natural meaning is like um, these spots mean measles, right? So if you've got spots, it means measles, and that's like a natural kind of meaning. But three rings on the bell of the bus means means the bus is full. Um, uh, but really? but it doesn't awesome. mean it. <laughs> I think so, and and it's like so so there's there's one kind of mean one one of these kinds of meaning is like a a natural sign for something, and the other of these kinds of meanings is like an artificial sign that. A speaker uses to um, cause the effect or something in the in the listener yeah, to, to like cause a red light. kind of intended effect. Right. I, yeah. Oof, yeah. I think I think Vincenzo would be very hostile towards that notion of natural meaning. Um, yeah, I I I I have serious qualms with. I think that's almost. I mean, that seems to me a sort of equivocation on the word meaning. That like the sense in which we come to understand that measles signals an underlying series of things that we have labeled uh sorry the spots signifies yeah, me, or, uh, yeah. yeah the, we can use the spots to detect some underlying set of uh, conditions in the body that we call measles is not at all the same sort of thing that uh when we say we're the, the meaning of a sentence or meaning of a word or meaning of a statement is its use those seem to me like opposite uses or not opposite but very different importantly mm -hmm. different uses of the word meaning but yeah yeah, and I, I think that that way of, um, I think that what that philosophy does is it just kind of pushes, it, it pushes back this philosophical hunt for essences, the kind of thing that Wittgenstein's against, just back to this sort of philosophy of mind question about, well, what is like semantic representation or something in, in people? Um, but so so everything's it, it, everything's neatly understood as far as the theory goes about how it is that we come to mean things or communicate and and all of the, those sort of aspects of the theory. But I I think Wittgenstein would be more critical of, of that approach. But I say this without being an expert in it at all. You know, maybe there's more nuance that I'm missing and uh, all of that. Sh shall I read twenty four now? Or, and I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. Place. Good, good. Please. Someone who does not bear in mind the variety of language games will perhaps be inclined to ask questions like, what is a question? Is it a way of stating that I do not know such and such, or that I wish the other person would tell me? Or is it a description of my mental state of uncertainty? And is the cry, help, such a description? Remember how many different kinds of things are called description. Description of a body's position by means of its coordinates, Description of a facial expression, description of a sensation of touch, of a mood. Of course, it is possible to substitute for the usual form of a question, the form of a statement or a description. I want to know whether, dot, 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 or I am in doubt whether, dot, dot, dot. But this does not bring the different language games any closer together. The significance of such possibilities of transformation, for example, of turning all assertoric sentences into sentences with the prefix, I think, or I believe, and thus, as it were, into descriptions of my inner life, will become clearer in another place. So this has got to be a critique of certain trends in analytic philosophy that, that say, you know, there is a dog on the mat is equivalent to saying, I think there is a dog on the mat, right? Um, he'd want, or I believe there's a dog on the mat. He's saying that, 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 the, that the first, the historic sentence, there is a dog on the mat. Or why am I using dog? There's a cat on the mat is, is equivalent to, uh, I think, I believe there is a cat on the mat. And he's going to say that's wrong. That actually right. saying, I believe there's a cat on the mat accomplishes something different in the English right. language game that you and I play uh, than just saying there's a dog on the mat. It is communicating extra information to you. It is signaling more things. I think yeah, it does something else. Yeah. This is going to, uh, this is part of, going to be part of his critique that we're going to see later of um, the sort of, turning sentences into uh what is it f open parentheses x there is su there is such a thing as, you know the sort of like a uh, logical um, function right functional you know math turning natural language into mathematics that was being that was being well, i think this is a philosophy. well i think this is proposition six in the tractatus is what 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 you just said um hang on let me see if i can find oh, that's good is it really tractatus tr there's a tractatus tree um, which I wonder if I'm... Oh, that's not the right thing. Do you have um, a commentary up in front of you or something? Um, Do I? Uh, no, I, I'm just seeing if I can bring up the Tractatus tree thing to show you that, because I think it'll express it'll express that point that you were just making. Um, let me see. Well, mine says um, six. parentheses yeah, solipsism. 
after that paragraph you just read Ian. Yeah. So it's kind of like what you were summarizing, what he was raging, and you said he'll go into it again later. I'm not actually sure what the parentheses solipsism thing is doing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neither am I. <laughs> maybe, well, I think I think maybe it's something. I I mean I got I got the sense that there's some idea about the philosophy of mind in there, and and yeah. I know Wittgenstein has views about that when people try and talk about events and processes um, and stuff like that to do with philosophy of mind, he's got criticisms of that whole endeavor. But um, I I don't know really what the parentheses solipsism means you know why why that's there it's uh... i mean these are his notes right i mean it's a, it's a little too simplistic because he definitely was preparing drafts of this for like publishing and stuff but like i think there's a i mean could it be this is a reminder to himself <laughs> that like this is also <laughs> yeah, an that's idea true. it seems to me like if i'm reading it correctly yeah, this hey, is you can expand of, on this here. yeah right exactly if this is a critique of the analytic philosophical tradition this is a note that, like, also you could talk about this here, <laughs> because it doesn't seem to be related to the kinds of people he's critiquing in the above section. But I can see a different right, right. line of argument from this that could critique uh, the sorts of philosophers who would say that particular constructions of language or epistemology lead to solipsism. Which is that, anyways. That's all. I don't know. Do you have any other readings? So, so here's a uh, here's proposition six from the Tractatus on screen. Um, so this is from Wittgenstein's earlier work. The general form of a truth function is, and then you know all these symbols. This is That's the general great. form of a proposition. There's, uh, and I think I think uh, at least at least my reading, alongside what you were saying about um, that's a different language game, is this what well, well, I, th- I I get the sense of two things. One of them is you know a question like what is a question. Uh, it almost just doesn't make sense devoid in our ordinary practices. Um, and then there's this seeming critique of, of what the philosopher is doing in trying to answer such questions in hunting for the general essence of such things, right? Um, in, in trying to find this commonality between them. Um, yeah. Do you think he would say you can't ask the question, what is a question? Like, you can't answer that question? Because I think he would, he would want I don't to, think like... he'd say that. Okay, but, yeah, good. Yeah. Go on. I don't, well, I'm not. I'm not sure he'd say you you couldn't ask the question. I think it would be it, it would be that asking asking the question or or trying to answer the question is engaging in a different practice than you you know it's ta- it's taking our language on holiday. It's taking question right, which it which has its use in all these contexts, and then taking it into this very specific que- other context where you then try and hunt for you know well the essence of a question now what i'm going to do is i'm going to look at all of these different language games where people use question and try and find what it is they all have in common you know whatever uh, how, how can i describe it how can i uh yeah interesting i hmm, yeah we, we can move on i there's more to be said about that but we can move on if you want yeah, to yeah uh 25 then it is sometimes said animals do not talk because they lack the mental abilities and this means they do not think or that is why they do not talk but they simply do not talk or better they do not use language if we disregard the most primitive forms of language uh, sorry if we disregard the most primitive forms of language giving orders asking questions telling stories having a chat are as much a part of our natural history as walking eating drinking and playing I feel like you have first read of comment if you want to, Nathan. <laughs> Having read it. Um, so, so I guess I guess one of the perhaps these these should be broken down even further because I feel like there's at least two you know key key parts to that one. Agreed. So one one of which is about the kind of um, the philosophy of my of mind idea the idea that um, well here's here's why animals don't don't work don't work don't talk and it's because you know it's because theory right it follow, it follows out from our theory but he's saying that this is sort of the wrong perspective to look at things through because instead what like it it's not like um, I, I don't know quite how to put it into words it's our, our theory isn't doing the right work um, we're not looking at what what is actually going on which is that language does things right and so animals can occupy forms of life where they use noises or do you know like they can do things and we could say well that that that's just as good evidence or you know for for theory right about mental behavior or whatever but that's a kind of confused way of looking at it we we need to look at language as this part of our natural history and then this kind of puzzle about um 
well, why do we have consciousness and animals don't sort of dissolves, right? Because we can see that it's it's just a, a, a variegated form of the same thing. I, I'm not quite articulating what I want to say there as well as could be said, but I think, I think that that's the right uh, thread. Uh, I've <laughs> I've long had qualms uh, with Wittgenstein's discussion of animals throughout this book. Um, it's like I actually think like a Wittgensteinian uh, account of language should actually make us more ready to say that the different things that animals do are right, our language. more closely <laughs> analogous to what we do with language. And I, I and even collapsing these two parts of twenty five into each other almost like makes me. Think that even more <laughs> like the so if we they claim that animals don't talk and that's only true if we disregard the most basic functions of language um and i want to say i want to first ask him like okay explain to me what the basic functions of language are as opposed to the others uh and then then he goes on to say that language is just part of our natural history as much as walking it's just another behavior we do um set of behaviors kinds mm. of behaviors and i just like if he's right that you know that these that language is just a set of things we do with certain parts of our body that grow out of our other behaviors and ways of life and conventions we have together what's to say that um a dog barking to intimidate another dog isn't, yeah, isn't also that. part of language i mean <laughs> yeah. i if you know i you know sometimes I use language with, for no purpose other than to intimidate a person. Like, I hope I don't do that very often, but I'm sure I've done it. Um, <laughs> right. like, that's my goal. Um, yeah. And how that seems to me a, a kind of way you can use language that would should, we could add to his list yeah. in the previous sentence. And that seems very closely analogous yeah. to a dog barking at another dog. Um, but I, I just, I don't know. I think, I wonder if this has been written on because I think the, the, we'll talk about the lions, you know, the lion learning to talk, speak English and things like that. But I just think throughout, actually, he like, he should be saying the other things you should be saying yeah. actually animals i agree do participate in kinds of behaviors that are closely analogous to language mm. I, I i do actually think that's right um but i also think i think that th this is sort of in tension with an emphasis that i think he's trying to make which is that languages are forms of life and so for like other animals you know their forms of life are so different from ours that um we can't I... we can't sort of yeah make that transfer and sorry sorry and i'm no, um, I'm sorry, you because you were trying to articulate something earlier okay. too. So, but you, you can finish your thought. I'm sorry. Um, uh, other forms of life. Yeah. Well, well, all, all that all that I'm saying is I, I think there are there are two sort of there's two ways of looking at this, and I think they're both sort of right, but they're both in because I think um, Wittgenstein's aim in the book isn't to make an argument sort of thing. You know, like, like here are my premises and here's the conclusion, but it's to bring the reader to see something from a different perspective. Um, and so I think maybe the rhetorical force of getting people to see languages as forms of life and the differences between forms of life, maybe the rhetorical emphasis of doing that is in conflict with the actual sort of conclusion of what's being said, which is that animals are also, you know, just as legitimately um, engaged in languages as, as people are as well. And I think that, but, but I think it's a result of trying to um, show someone that, distinction rather than just sort of like say it, it say it as like um here's my theory or something for sure i wanted to respond to what ian said i think i think like the the thing uh, 25 that we just read actually agrees with what you were saying um when you read it in the in the full context you know i think like your criticism i mean you know you maybe you were addressing it generally but like i love this this other um, translation, um, uh, it's sometimes said that animals don't talk because they lack the mental capacity. And this means they do not think and that is why they do not talk. But, and there's a long dash, they simply do not talk. So it, I, I feel like it goes to a primitive kind of thing. It's like we are doing the same thing as animals. And, you know, without launching into a, a, a long thing, you know, it's like uh, I feel... You know, I read I read a really interesting article about animal rights and how we've been trying to teach chimps sign language and like our apes, and that's somehow indicative of their equality. But like the fact that they understand pain and suffering and like attachment and like um, neglect, you know, and all those things associated with it, like we're kind of 
by placing the emphasis on language, we're kind of missing the 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 point that of the commonality that we have with all creatures, you know, um, pleasure and suffering being uh, or comfort and suffering. I think that is the confusing line for me because <laughs> when, when he says, "But they simply do not talk," it seems like it seems like within what everything else that the context of everything else he's saying, he should say like. But they do talk, you know, <laughs> um, because talking just means um, practices within a language game, right? And the, but I, hmm. I, what hmm. if what if we take him to mean to use talk as distinct from uh, employ language? This is a, this right. is a total thought but experiment. The, I'm just no, this right. out speech. Here. Speech but is the word I would use because yeah. talking is 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 yeah, um, right. you know because like I mean t talking could be you know pass me the uh, bowl you know and I could grunt that to you. You know, pass the salt. You know, I but but speech would be rhetoric and and the the, the higher faculties. Right. I just wonder if yeah, the, the thought experiment I'm having I'm because like really dolphins, whales, they talk right. Like I mean, uh, and elephants. I learned they even have this long range like rumble because yeah. they have a really um, ultra like. Wittgenstein wave. wouldn't have known nearly yeah. as much as we do about the. Abilities of dolphins Animal. in particular, right? And and uh, but higher intelligence. But the thing is, though, but the fact is, though, we're the only creature that has speech, even if other animals do. Like, and and when he says the the most primitive forms of language, obviously, if a bird is chirping, you know, get away from my nest, or you know, where's my baby, or something, then then that's that's a form of communication that they have, right? But he's not talking about that, and he's making it clear. That's why he's like accepting. Okay, we're not talking about just the the growl or the roar. Yeah, I I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm looking at the German here, and I mean it's aber sie sprechen eben nicht. And then that's con in the next line, uh, or better, um, uh, he uses uh, you know die sprechen nicht. You know, so he's, it's not language and talk here aren't really different words. Um, it's the same. Yeah, speech though. Sprach the is, word, yeah. would be speak uh, connected with English speech also, right? right well, Thus speaks Zarathustra, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know German, but. I don't know. I think my my theory was wrong. I was kind of hoping like maybe we could take take it to be something like, but animals just don't engage in the kinds of, in the behavior is the same way we do. Yeah, the same game they, as we do. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. But they do engage in their own kinds of behaviors, and some of them involve using the vocal cords. But I, I don't, I'm not sure that's even a plausible reading of what they doing. Like, they even lie, right? Like, um, because I was learning that, like, um, pit bulls, like, other dogs didn't, generally don't lie. But I was um, reading a newspaper. A police officer was saying that a pit bull will act friendly. And then it'll lunge at your throat once you walk in the uh, beyond the fence. And so yeah. other dogs don't have that deception, which is an incredible ability and you know um, terrifying. But yeah, <laughs> there's also there also seems to be an in good research into like interspecies language games between dogs and humans because there's ways that dogs will communicate with humans like a pit, you know the the way the things that they do to appear cute to us and stuff like that, but that they won't do with each other. Um, right. And so that's that's quite interesting because the, the I, I'd say under Wittgenstein's sort of um, definition of what a form of life is like that's clearly a form of life for the dog like making you know that like begging for food right that mm -hmm. could be in the in the list of uh, <laughs> of things but they sort of, they don't do that with each other right it's only to to us uh, weird primates that have uh, socialized them that they do it. I do really like Nathan your account of the rhetoric. I think you're probably right. I think it's this this is. It's somewhat in tension with his, his conclusion, but you can see why what he's doing, why he's saying that here. He's trying to get us to see the way of life as, as constitutive of language, and yeah, I think so. Um, do you want to do twenty six and I'm <clears throat> sure. Um, it's cool you have access to the German. One thinks that learning language consists in giving names to objects, viz. to human beings, to shapes, to colors to pains, to moods, to numbers, etc. To repeat, naming something is like attaching a label to a thing. One can say that this is preparatory to the use of a word, but what is it a preparation for? I think mm. for, yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think that this is, um, this fits in quite well with the criticism of 
the previous um, prominent theories of language, right? Because in in a lot of these theories, there's a lot of discussions, partic particularly around what names do, right? Philosophy of language to do with, well, what does a name mean? Does a name denote its referent directly? Or is a name a kind of internal cluster of descriptions that a speaker means or something like that? And the idea is that in, the, in these um, theories of language, that names somehow pick out objects in the world. And that, and this is part of like a, a picture theory against which the the general criticism is being levied. That well, well, names in a language, well, they they denote things, right? And you have you have your theory of denoting. And so, then the idea is, well, when we look at look at how you look at then in light of how what language actually does, how it's used, and how we learn it, for example, how does how does that theory comport to that? So you know, you you learn the names. But then what's that preparation for? And then I think the next critique is going to sort of um, address why the other theory is kind of wrong in the next section and why there's a preferable way of looking at what names do. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we've talked about this before in the previous reading episodes, but it's I think it's essential that names the, the, even the, the our ability to use names to pick up particular objects is embedded in a bunch of other activities and assumptions that we you know when i pointed a thing and say this is a, a gavaga that you know what part of it what thing i you know am i talking about the color am i talking about the whole setup the whole structure of a thing or am i talking about just the rabbit running through the trees so yeah, it's a coin invoking some coin here um uh that even even the very simple basic use of a noun if i want to get you to grab me a thing and we so we, we assign a name to a thing is embedded in all these other activities and behaviors we have where i right. if i say something i want you to go get it for me and i can point to a table and say this is a table and you know i'm not talking about the entire living room set you know or just or just the wooden top of the living room set and asking you to take it off of the stand or the, of the table so yeah. anyways that's all we've, and we've but, but importantly, I, I honestly can't remember that much about the previous episode. I remember more the like slab block stuff at the start. Than well, the, the grocery really... store example, the three red apples. Yeah, yeah. How do you know which part of that is the three and the red and the apples and which part of the right. display case that refers to and there's five red apples. But I, I think that the, the reason that this is quite effective against... But, because on the particularly the store the little part of Augustine that's taken out of um, context right at the start is because the idea might be that um, as you acquire a language you know adults point towards a thing and and go um, I don't know glasses case or pen or whatever and then and then you learn that that's the name for it but then that's dependent on as it, as if you've got this kind of mental ease you know this this sort of language and you go ah so um you know you go in mentalese ah so pen means pen in english or something and you set up this uh translate but that's not the that can't that can't be the way that your language acquisition is happening right um, um do you want to go with 27 ian yep we name things and then we talk about them can can refer to them in talk confused about the grammar there I think uh, you missed can in the first sentence, so it made the second one oh, so confusing. Thank you. We name things and then we can talk about them, can refer to them in talk, as if what we did next were given with the mere act of naming, as if there were only one thing called talking about things, whereas, in fact, we do the most various things with our sentences. Think just of exclamations with their completely different functions. Water, exclamation point. Away, exclamation point. Oh, exclamation point. Help, exclamation point. Splendid, no. Are you still unkind to call these words names of objects? In languages two and eight, I think that's got to be grocery store and slab and block, right? Hmm. Um, yeah. That's my guess. Uh, in languages two and eight, there was no such thing as asking something's name. This with its correlate, ostensive explanation, is, we might say, a language game in its own right. That is really to say, we are brought up, trained, to ask, what is that called? 
upon which the name is given. And there is also a language game of inventing a name for something that is saying, this is called dot, dot, dot. And then using the, the new name, and then using the new name. So for example, children give names to their dolls and then talk about them and to them. Consider in this connection, how singular is the use of a person's name to call him? Yeah, it is pretty singular. Uh, it's pretty odd. But um, you're right, you're given a name and you don't have any say in it. And that's your name for the rest of your life, like it or not. <laughs> you know, I mean, generally, right? But um, no, but I was just also thinking like, um, I'm from India. So uh, but in Persian also, but I know Korean culture is even more like amplified with this. But um, you have a, a formal and an informal uh, sense in the language, right? Spanish has it. So do many romance languages, but Korean has like seven tenses of like what level of bosses you have. So people have different ring don'ts depending on like whether it's their principal or their boss or, you know, their parents or whatnot. Interesting. Yeah. And um, so, but, um, but uh, I remember learning as a small child, like age 10, like we went to India, you know, um, and it's like, I was like, what do you call each one of your uncles or your paternal uncle or your maternal uncle? And like, how do you refer to them? And it's like pretty complicated. And also like, also you have to remember to use the formal sense because like you're a 10 year old child and they're like 70 years old. So it has to be like utmost deference. And so, um, yeah, the, like those language games are really important in, I, mean, I don't want to simplify, but honor shame cultures or um, right. in any kind of traditional um, like uh, royalty, imperial hierarchy. Hmm. I, th I think uh, for me in this part, one, one of the things that's interesting um, in seeing that um, that veil of theory, you know, seeing through that veil of theory is that idea of just appending these these nouns with a kind of exclamation point at the end. Um, I, I mean, they're not all nouns, of course, but but the, the idea that you can have a noun and just put an exclamation point at the end, and then all of a sudden the theory sort of doesn't work about um, what... You, yeah. you just look at what someone's doing with it in, in exclaiming and you kind of like, well, they're not denoting the thing anymore. Like what you, you, you need a bit more context to figure out what was going on. I mean, this isn't what yeah. Wittgenstein's saying. So maybe I'm just uh, interpreting all of this as to why he's, he's done that there, but that th this was my train of thought, um, particularly with, you know, water exclamation mark. I just um, thought of one uh, land, right. And if you're on a seafaring ship like Columbus right. and you haven't seen land for like three months, you know, land yeah. ahoy is, a, is is not just, you know, land as an earth or dirt or a continent. Yeah. And, and of course, like, you know, the these other theories do have something to say about these other parts of language. It's just that they they really minimize that part of language in favor of this, um, you know, this truth act logical calculus part. And so I think I think for a few reasons, maybe Victor science theory does a better job because it's there's like a common cause here so you don't need to postulate like all these all these different things going on um in what he's got to say about it but then also it, se it seems to fit more with a bunch of what the sciences and stuff have to tell us about who we are and what the world's made up of and where we've come from and stuff and how our faculties work um so that those are my thoughts on that part but then on the yeah on the second part i think that's inter interesting because there's this I there's almost this idea of um basicality of of different language games so they they sort of build it, it's not that then you know i don't know what wittgenstein would say to sort of like the chomsky idea of a universal grammar or something like that because i, I don't think that wittgenstein's getting at the idea that there's some there's some given universal basic language game that everyone must participate in or something but at least within our within our practices there seem to be you know there seem to be certain practices that are, are more basic like um well what's this right and once once you've acquired what's this, and if someone else has this is, and they're a competent speaker of the language, they can um, basically socialize you into the rest of the the language because all you need to do is go, well, what's this or whatever, and you can kind of build. I mean, you might need a bit more than that, but um, I think that that's that's quite interesting because you you realize that 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 is that reciprocal thing. It's like you you've just learned you've learned how to. Um, 
project yourself into into the world and also how to cause someone else to give you some information that you acquire right once you've got what's this and and someone else and you succeed in getting someone else to provide you with the uh with the name of something or a description or whatever yeah i just wanted to comment on the, the charm skin thing i don't um i don't see any tension between at least like a neo chomsky and like an evolutionarily biologically written neo chomsky and account of language acquisition and wittgenstein any more than there is like wittgenstein would see a tension between like okay so there's no more tension between saying that there is like stuff in our brain that uh mechanically sort yeah, of right. dictates how language works yeah uh any the more than there is to of, yeah. say that like throwing is a is is he, how humans throw objects is somehow there's, dictated th by there's the something in my finger hands. that yeah. means it bends that way <laughs> yeah precisely yeah and right. that, that doesn't you know i i I don't, I, there is a sort yeah. of like rhetorical high level, like Wittgenstein saying everything is, but he's not saying everything is just socially constructed. He's saying that it's part of just our behaviors and the, you know, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I, Chomsky, people think near Chomsky and least are saying more than they are sometimes. Um, well, well for, from my point of view, my, the reason I said that was uh, because I didn't want to give the impression that I think that Wittgenstein says there's some privileged language game, like English language right. or something, from yeah. which all the others are to be described or something. You know, the, the sort of awareness to have is that, okay, well, I'm, de I'm describing what I think is going on from within a, a set of practices, whatever, but this isn't like yeah. a privileged standpoint or something, you know? Like, no, of course uh, not, yeah. Yeah. That was what I meant to communicate by saying that, you know, so, so not like if you figure out what the Chomsky and universal grammar is or something, you can like then from that standpoint, describe everything else perfectly is like right. uh, this set of deductions or something. I don't know. Which is, which is not of course what Chomskyans believe. <laughs> right. At least not the ones that I've read. Uh, okay. Section 28, unless there's anything anyone wants to say. Cool. Um, now one can ostensibly define a person's name, the name of a color, the name of a material, a number word, the name of a point of the compass, and so on. The definition of the number two, that is called two, pointing to two nuts, is perfectly exact. But how can the number two be defined like that? The person, the person one gives the definition to doesn't know what it is that one wants to call two. He will suppose that two is the name given to this group of nuts. He may suppose this, but perhaps he does not. He might make the opposite mistake. When I want to assign a name to this group of nuts, he might take it to be the name of a number. And he might equally well take a person's name, which I explain ostensibly, as that of a colour, of a race, or even of a point of the compass. That is to say, an ostensive definition can be variously interpreted in any case. And then there's uh, a bit in a box that I'll read. Could one explain the word red by pointing to something that was not red? That would be as if one had to explain the word modest to someone whose English was poor, and one pointed to an arrogant man and said, that man is not modest. That it is ambiguous is no argument against such a form of explanation. Any explanation can be misunderstood. But one might well ask, are we still to call this an explanation? For of course it plays a different role in the calculus from what we ordinarily call an extensive explanation of the word red, even if it has the same practical consequences, the same effect on the learner. I don't know if we want to comment too much on what's in the box and maybe because there's a lot of stuff there. That's a crazy way to explain the color red, to point to every other color and explain that that's <laughs> not red. It's not that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. And I think I think there's a bit where there's a bit a bit later on where Wittgenstein also talks about um if someone painted brown or something and then it was a bit brighter on the other day, you know, would they would they say it's not brown anymore or how would they like account for the brightness or dark that that might sh shed a bit of interesting light on this. But but I I find this a very interesting again way way of thinking about things because I reflect on like my own language acquisition or teaching someone else or the ways I communicate with people. And I do think, you know, there is this, there is a, of course this indeterminacy to the things that I say. And uh, yeah, it is, it is kind of interesting, like how, how I succeed in um, communicating to, to someone that I'm like teaching what two things are rather than any of these other 
candidate ways that they could, it, it, you know, if they if they've got well, this is two, you know, if they, if they know what this is and and my pointing, like how how they get the right idea of what I'm pointing at, right, rather than any of these other features. I, felt, I find that interesting. I actually want to use the lighter shade of brown example to help us think about what Wittgenstein is doing in these two sections here, um, the 28 and the bit pulled forward um, in the box, which is to actually try to answer your question, Nathan, like, so when someone paints a lighter shade of brown, how do I know whether or not I want to call this brown also? Um, and I think the answer to that question has to be that you try it a few times or, you know, or, uh, are you paying attention to it? Are you really doing it? Um, yeah. And if it's effective, it's, if it's working to accomplish the goals that you're, that you're using it for in conversation, in, in cooperation with your society, with the people you're with, then you realize, oh, like that degree of difference will work to call it the same color, at least in this context, in this place. Uh, then you walk into a fashion store and you discover that like, that's not brown. That's, I don't know what a shade of brown is that a clothing designer, yeah. but in this context, <laughs> like that's not brown at all. That's a totally different color. Um, and so the way you learn that two refers to the number of things and the red refers to this or the, this quality of a thing, as opposed to that quality of thing or arrogance is this or that, um, is going to be going to be success. In, right? Yeah, exactly. Embedded in pragmatic context. It's going to be yeah. what allows you to achieve the goals you want with that you know the, that utterance from your from your mouth yeah. or your pen and I, and I think that this this comes into the criticism of um this comes into the criticism of philosophy as well because i remember like when i when i first started getting into philosophy as well and interviewing guests for example i remember there's there's questions that i've asked graham priest and i think he's great at stopping and pausing and thinking about things i remember saying so what's like the ontology of logic or something and um you know i hadn't really got I, I hadn't used or I didn't really understand this word ontology much. So then his response when he was like, I'm not sure what you're saying was like, oh, okay, I can't use it like that. Like it's not, that's not a successful deployment of ontology. Um, whereas other times I have said ontology and someone's given me, you know, the kind of positive response that I'm trying to achieve by invoking, by, by uttering the, the noise. Um, and then I'm like, and, I, and I'm more comfortable with using it in those ways or ways that have, a very close resemblance to those ways, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's completely right. And but Wittgenstein's point here is that that goes not only to like fancy words like ontology, but all the way down to words like red and mommy right. and two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that fundamentally figuring out how to use this thing, these things we call language totally depends on these sort of shared activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not I, baptizing things. Go ahead. Sorry. And, and not what? Not baptizing things. I was a cryptic reference. Not, yeah. It's not simply like designating. Yeah. Uh, you know. I hereby declare this. Right. Ship, the, yeah. Sorry, I'm. Or christening. So, right. Right. Or just uh, smashing. Well, that, well, that's the story. Glass. In in naming and necessity, um, Kripke's theory is well. Well, there's a few parts to his theory. You know, like that. Like people have these necessary characteristics. You know, like having the parents that they have or something. That's like. Um, a necessary um, part of your essence, right, as an am. But also the, the idea of how, of how names work is that there's, like, something gets named um, and then there's this causal kind of chain between anyone who uses the name and the initial baptism of something by that name. So when I say Aristotle, um, the way that I succeed in referring to Aristotle is through this causal chain that goes all the way back to when presumably Aristotle's parents, though it could have been someone else, you know, said, oh, Arist like this kid is Ar called Aristotle, right? And then he and was named. And <laughs> the thing that's refreshing about that is there's something obviously right about that. Like there's something obviously like true as a historical account. But anyways, we, we should, no, you were going to say. But there's also something I think obviously wrong and implausible <laughs> about it as well. <laughs> like that is yeah. like, you know, my, my saying Aristotle isn't like associated to that, but it, it's like, there's a, so there's this element of truth and this obvious element of falsehood. Right. I mean, there's, there's my saying Aristotle is also associated to like me being in, in school and, um, people talking about these Greeks and it's like, oh, like classics has this, uh, there's this kind of sense of erudition or whatever to classics. And it's like, so you say Aristotle and then all of a sudden people like give you an air of plausibility to, um, yeah. it's not just me, me denoting the person back through history or something. Right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I had to look up the word ostensive. So it means demonstrative. So, I mean, it's like what you were saying. It is pretty wild how, like, I can point to two objects and you'll know I'm talking about those two objects in general or the, the word two or the notion of two. It's, it's a very, um, but yeah, I just, uh, I learned something from, a. It's a good lesson, for, but it was from a Scientologist of all people. But it's like if you run into a word you don't know, oh, like look it up right away, and that helps you move forward. Otherwise, um, they say that if you ever give up on text, it's probably because you know you just stumbled on a word you didn't know and you kept moving, and uh, right. never ever do that. You know, just just uh, put in the effort to try to understand yeah. everything. Uh, do you want to go with section twenty nine and M? Sure. Thank you. Perhaps you can say two can only be ostensively defined in this way. This number is called two. For the word number here, choose what place in language, in grammar, we assign to the word. But this means that the word number must be explained before the ostensive definition can be understood, the demonstrative. The word number in the definition does indeed shoe this place, does shoe the post at which we station the word, and we can prevent misunderstandings by saying this color is called so-and-so, this length is called so-and-so, and so on. That is to say, misunderstandings are sometimes averted in this way. But is there only one way of taking the word color or length? Well, they just need defining. Defining, then, by means of other words. And what about the last definition in this chain? Do not say there isn't a last definition. That is just as if you chose to say, there isn't a last house in this road. One can always build an additional one. Whether the word number is necessary in the ostensive definition depends on whether without it, the other person takes the definition otherwise than I wish. And that will depend on the circumstances under which it is given and on the person I give it to. And how he takes the definition is seen in the use that he makes of the word defined. Yeah, um, I think I, I find a lot in that quite difficult. But the part that um, brings some clarity to it in that last bit is the for me is the depends on whether without this word, the other person takes the definition otherwise than I wish, which I think is is it, it's making this point about um, success, as Ian said, being embedded in pragmatic context, right, rather than it being embedded in um, a kind of theory about language or something that um, where the explanation of which, I, what am I thinking? Like, um, I don't quite know how to put it, how to put into words what I'm thinking about that first part, really. Um, maybe I'll have a look at it and someone else can share their thoughts. He's just confronting, he's anticipating an objection. Someone uh, points to the two nuts and says, uh, well, no, you just, you just tell the person that yeah, it's the number two, of nuts, the two is, is the number of nuts. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but how do they know what the word number means uh you know you're, you're, you're um and this gets yeah. you into the sort of regressive thing uh and um and i'm not totally i don't totally understand what the house row the row of houses yeah that's what is doing there. yeah yeah that's what um, is confusing for me so like like because i end so there's this part where he says i i get the um one could always say bit where he's like well, one could always say you can add another. You can add another house. So maybe maybe the point is, um, you could always add another word that seems to be elucidating um, that that primitive like this thing. But then the question would be, I, I don't know. Is that is that right, or is that that might be the wrong thing? <laughs> the, the way. Oh, um, no, do you want to proffer a reading? Uh, go go ahead, because you've read more than I have on this. Uh, I. <laughs> The way I read this is this is poorly edited, <laughs> um, which is to say, <laughs> which is just to say that I think I um, Wittgenstein does think you can talk about the last house on a row, despite the fact that you can add a house. Uh, so he he actually doesn't like the appeal to regression as showing the incoherence of a thing because he does believe you can talk about the last row in the house, even though it is also true you can add another house because the last row of the house still functions in a language game to pick out the, the last house in the row, sorry, last house in the row, uh, effectively. 
and he is simply inserting, as I read this, and I could be totally wrong, but as I read this, he is inserting this little clause here saying that actually like appeals to, to regression aren't, don't work. Like you can, I don't know, maybe this is wrong. I have a hard time putting it's that a weird bit. to the previous. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. Um, but I think you're exactly right that the key really is these last two paragraphs. I mean, there are two paragraphs in my printing or it could be, it should be just one big paragraph maybe, but, um, uh, the, that the word number is necessary in extensive definition of two depends on whether without this word, the other person takes the definition otherwise than I wish. And that will depend on the circumstances and how he takes the explanation shows itself in how he uses the word explained. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, so that's the other side of the coin, because you can, you can think about it from the perspective of the learner, but you think about it then from the perspective of, of the teacher and it's like, well, how do they understand success, right? And it again, there's not like some weird psychic thing going on. You then observe the effects, uh, you know, of, of uttering your your noise or whatever whatever it is that you've done. And um, if they seem to be doing the right thing, then you're like, yeah, they've got it, right? And then the people who don't do that, you know, the people who scribble two and two and then write one zero after it, you're like, ah, they've not quite got it yet. Um, I think the really nice place again to look at this is the spectrum of the color spectrum, which is there is no inherently obvious way to chunk the differences between blue and green in the middle, but we we chunk them for our pragmatic purposes, uh, and the context in which chunking you know one uh, or sorry categorizing one um, item, yeah, or a particular instance of a color. I was looking for something blue on my desk. Um, you know, whether this is blue or green in a particular context. It's totally going to depend on like who you're talking to, where you are, where you're at, right. what your goals are, um, and uh, where that fits. And that doesn't mean that those words aren't language or have meaning or have use. Um, it's just that that's going to be totally dependent on um, how you're using them. I, I do think this there. I, it, it, I, there's a lot of interesting stuff to say. So it's like uh, like balancing that with making progress through the book. But um, for sure, the. It's interesting how this fits with, you know, what biology has to tell us about how we fit into the world and stuff like that as well, because um, there's good evidence as well that this, the language that we occupy sort of alters our perception or how we think of the world and stuff like that, you know, and like in the, in those languages where people have more words for blue, they can pick out more shades of blue, right, than uh, in those languages where people where people can't as well so it's, it's interesting like um how those practices that we adopt like literally alter the the world that we occupy from like a from you know then going looking at things from like the phenomenologist point of view or almost like a solipsistic schopenhauerian um idealist sort of point of view it's like you know when you you're trapped in your world of experience but like you're your world of experience only means something insofar as you can talk about it or articulate it. You know, it's, it's like a kind of linguistic idealism or something. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have meaning apart from um, descriptions. But those those descriptions are like practices that are embedded in pragmatic activities and stuff. And that that's quite disconcerting. I, I can't perfectly put into words what I'm trying to say here. But whenever I sort of like grasp what I'm getting at here, there's this sort of sense of vertigo where I feel very. Um, I usually feel very comfortable in in the world and it's like the bottom just dropped out or something when i when i get the sense of what um of, of that thing that i'm trying to describe it's like oh there isn't like this meaning well there is meaning right because meaning means to succeed in the language game but there isn't this like reified proposition or something that stands behind it and then um i'm accessing the states of affairs in the world as they stand and everything just fits together perfectly um yeah it's quite i I find that w a weird aspect of going down this this route of thinking. Yeah, I just had to add a on the same note. Like the, I, I learned that there was a language with no word for blue. You know, so when you were talking about like so many different shades that they can pick out, like um, in Russian, you know, that, yeah, yeah, right. So and and so they view the color prism differently than we do, and you know, like you said, we're just so comfortable in our own um linguistic reality that like we just assume everybody sees the color wheel but even that can be right. drop out from and like you said it's like semantic vertigo um yeah so basically the, 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 that's all um 
And so, like, I, again, just to add to both of what you were saying, it's kind of a miracle that language even works, right? Like, because if we're semantically, first of all, how do you even demonstrate what a number is and, and abstractly, like, communicate that? And um, just, uh, again, tangents are hard to go on, but, like, chimps, like, they do under, like, you can, you can tell a chimp, like, this is more grapes than the other. But, like, I think what they have trouble with is, like, deferred gratification, like, I'll give you more grapes if you can hold off on, if you can take less grapes now, I'll give you more grapes later. Like, they really can't understand. Or um, even weight, right? Like a heavy bowling ball, like a 20-pound bowling ball will will knock over the puzzle to give you food. But they can't understand that, like a, um, anyway, like a different, different. so it's, I, I mean, you guys said Viking Sand didn't understand all this animal science that we have today. But it's just very interesting how, like, philosophically, this stuff holds up over time. Uh, do you want to go on 30, Ian? Um, I don't know how much time you guys have got as well. Um, feel free if you want to curtail, if either of you have got to start thinking about shutting things down or whatever, that's all right as well. Sure, I can do a few more sections. I don't know um, where a clean break would be. Yeah, it's difficult. But if we're, I mean, if we're doing one in like a month's time or something, it's not too bad if it's a bit awkward. Um, Maybe around 35? Yeah, 35. No, that's still, that's clarifying 34 still. Are we on 30? Yeah, I'm looking for a place to, where we can oh, break to and I, see I if see, that works with my schedule. Oh, I see. 40, just before 40, 39, um, 37 maybe. What's the relation okay. between the name and thing named? All right, that's plausible. I'm just saying, I, I mean, there might not be anything better than that. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I hear you. The like 50 that we're supposed to, we're supposed to read through in your first pass yeah. somewhere around yeah. there. In episode one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll just try and maybe offer a bit less commentary um, and yeah. 30, right? Yeah, yeah. So one could say an extensive definition explains the use, the, the meaning of a word if the role the word is supposed to play in the language is already clear. So if I know that someone means to explain a color word to me, the extensive, extensive explanation that is called sepia will enable me to understand the word. And one can say this as long as one does not forget to know all to, does not forget that now all sorts of questions are tied up with the words to know or to be clear. One has already to know or to be able to do something before one can ask what something is called. Oh, that's good. But what does one have to know? And I, I think that part of the problem in part of the problem with what Wittgenstein's trying to do here is that, you know, he's appealing to these very words that he's trying to like describe, you know, like like that um whole paragraph ends with what does one have to know? And then it's like, but the but the appeal is like talk about no in a in well, a paragraph yeah he, he's saying about like i want the brown coat and you're pointing at a array of coats you already need to know how to wear a coat and the other person needs to know how to grab a coat and what what a yeah. coat is for uh when yeah and yeah. things like that to know whether or not you've effectively used the word brown <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> The, yeah. And what the other person's behavior is supposed to be in response to you saying, I want the brown coat. Because, be, oh, that's very nice to learn about you, Nathan, that you want a brown coat. No, I want you to go grab it for me. Like, like those sorts of things. Pass me the milk. Can, exactly. can you pass me the milk? Yes, I can. <laughs> Learn, discovering that you've successfully used a word depends on, which, which it means that you know the word, depends on the sorts of behaviors uh, that we share that we are using the word in that context. Mm. That's pretty funny, though. Like, just tell someone, "Oh, I want a brown coat." Okay, that's nice that you want something. Okay, <laughs> like you know. Anyway, it's, it's it's you know like um, we would consider that. Are you from Mars or are you like Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek? You just don't like. Are you a robot? Like, do you? But, yeah, but imagine like you're trying to learn, figure out what the word brown means, and you say that phrase, and your friend no, understands you completely, and you've like in fact successfully used the word brown. He just doesn't realize that you wanted to hand it to him because he's part of some culture where that isn't how you know, or 
you know, some culture where it's saying that means that you want them to sell it to them. Or, I don't know, like you can imagine other contexts in which that phrase would mean something other than please hand it to me. <laughs> um, the person would never discover that they correctly used the word brown. <laughs> Okay, so th 31, uh, when one shows someone the king in chess and says, this is the king, one does not thereby explain to him the use of this piece unless he already knows the rules of the game except for this last point, the shape of the king. One can imagine his having learnt the rules of the game without ever having been shown an actual piece. The shape of the chess piece corresponds here to the sound of the shape of a word. However, one can also imagine someone's having learnt the game without ever learning or formulating rules. He might have learned quite simple board games first by watching and have progressed to more and more complicated ones. He too might be given the explanation, this is the king. If, for instance, he were being shown chess pieces of a shape unfamiliar to him, this explanation again informs him of the use of the piece only because, as we might say, the place for it was already prepared. In other words, we'll say that it informs him of the use only if the place is already prepared. And in that case, it is so. Not because the person to whom we give the explanation already knows rules, but because, in another sense, he has already mastered a game. Consider this further case. I am explaining chess to someone, and I begin by pointing to a chess piece and saying, this is the king, it can move in this and this way, and so on. In this case, we shall say the words, this is the king, or this is called the king, are an explanation of a word only if the learner already knows already knows what a piece in a game is. That is, if, for example, he has already played other games, or has watched with understanding how other people play, and similar things. Only then will he, while learning the game, be able to ask relevantly, what is this called? That is, this chess piece. We may say it only makes sense for someone to ask what something is called if he already knows how to make use of the name. We can, after all, imagine the person who is asked replying, decide what to call it yourself. And now the one <laughs> and now the one who asked would himself be answerable for everything. OK, so <laughs> first, first thing to say about that passage is, I, I mean, building off of what, what was just said before, really, is that. Um, it, what, it, what it's showing is this kind of dependence and layering between language games and, and the context that we're embedded in. So when it comes to um, someone asking or, or, or teaching someone how to use a chess piece, right, there's all these different ways that we can think of the, the answer being relevant to that person depending on the context that they have. But then a further point that Wittgenstein raises, you know, re regardless of whether or not they know you know, the moves and just haven't, you know, maybe they've been just playing it with online chess pieces, or maybe they've been playing it with the Lord of the Rings set. And so they don't quite understand, um, you know, that just the little horse or whatever means a knight and can move like this. And you're, you're trying to teach them that uh, and bring them into the practice of playing chess. But then there's this further um, shared context to, to asking or, or to teaching them what the pieces do, which is what a game is, right? Um, because, in, in in other imaginable contexts, someone might say, "What is this?" Right, and you say, "Oh, it's beechwood." You know, <laughs> like um, that. There's not like a contradiction or something like immediately wrong. What's wrong is they're in the wrong that they're they're, they're um, playing the wrong language game, right? When they when they respond in that way. Um, that those are those are my initial thoughts. If anyone else has anything they want to come in with. Or it's a staunton chess set, or um, you know, or uh, it's weighted. Um, oh, he's also really funny when he says, um, "Why don't you decide for yourself what it's called?" You know, like who would want to ever teach you a board game if you have a smart Alec <laughs> answer like that? <laughs> um, I'm just reading over, by the way. So if there's if there's dead air. Don't feel too awkward. I've not forgotten that we're streaming or whatever. Um, I'm just thinking. And, you know, we, we were saying before, you have to know the context. Like, if you, did you play checkers before? You know what a board game is. You know what leisure time is. You know, if you had just Mowgli from the jungle, like, he wouldn't even know 
like the, the idea of spending leisure time with wooden figurines on a board what that is so that so that's uh a phrase the phrase that he well i mean i don't know if how that translates from the german but he says um this explanation again informs him of the use of the piece only because as we might say the place for it was already prepared so the the place for the explanation is prepared by that shared um the the shared set of that shared set of practices um, between the explainer and the explainee. Um, okay, do you want to go with 32 then, Anam? Unless uh, anything you want to say, Ian, feel free. Yeah. Thank you. Someone coming into a strange country will sometimes learn the language of the inhabitants from ostensive definitions that they give him. And he will often have to guess the meaning of these definitions and we'll sometimes guess right and sometimes wrong. And now I think we can say Augustine describes the learning of human language as if the child came into a strange country and did not understand the language of the country. That is, as if it already had a language, only not this one. Or again, as if the child could already think, only not yet speak. And think would here mean something like talk to itself yeah that was that was a thing i was uh referring to earlier but but i think that this that at least the first the the low-hanging fruit here is um that pragmatic success thing and i i mean i've certainly recently had that experience when i went to spain for example and i started learning spanish for the first time um just before going and so do the first few levels on duolingo or whatever um, and learning, you know, the different the different cases for things when you're addressing someone else or saying something, um, saying something of yourself, right? There, there's like these different endings for like I have versus like do you have or whatever. Uh, and I remember like I having just done a Duolingo session on asking someone, you know, do you have, and not being sure if I was adding the right ending to the word because I, I mean it could have been the problem is it could have been any number of reasons for which the ticket officer that I was asking, you know, do you have tickets to wherever I was going, sort of pulled a funny face. It could just be that I pronounce things weird because I'm a foreigner and don't properly speak the language. But it also could have been that I've like just used the wrong case ending and that's in my mind. And it, it's like this, you know, I'm trying to just succeed with my language, right? I'm in, I'm in a foreign country um, and and sometimes some something goes wrong and that's how you kind of like, uh, over time, you figure out what the right thing is to say. Maybe I'd say it in a few different ways a few times. And then she'd go, ah, tu hablas, uh, or something. And I'd be like, ah, okay. and then I can now, and then I'd go, tu hablas, and then she'd like nod or something. And that's like maybe a shared behavior you'd have. And, and then from then on, I'd say it in the correct, the correct way. Um, yeah, but, that, but then- Pragmatic the, success. But the, but the reductio then of the, of the second half is that, um, so on the other theory, rather than it being like that, as we experience acquiring a language, it's instead um, more like you just sort of say it to yourself and you're like, you know, this translates to this from, from mental ease to um, natural language or whatever. He's also uh, making the distinction here, though. It's one thing if you already know a language and you're translating in your head to another language. It's quite another thing to even develop the, uh, the, the, like you said, the place for it, you know, like uh, when we were talking about the, what the king is and what the king right. is. How yeah, do you yeah. even get that place started, which is crazy. Hmm. Yeah, it just kind of builds up. It's like, you know, like pat it, things build up and there are gaps and the patches get filled in. But that, that seems to be a natural description of what happens, I, I guess. Um, do you want to go with 33 in? But what if someone objected, it is not true that one must already be a master of a language game in order to understand an extensive definition. Rather, one need only obviously know or guess what the person giving the explanation is pointing at. That is, whether, for example, at the shape of the object or its color or the number or so on. And what does pointing at the shape, pointing at the color, consist in? Point at a piece of paper and now point at its shape, now at its color, and now at its number. That sounds odd. Well, how do you do it? You'll say that you meant something different each time you pointed. And if I ask how that is done, you'll say you concentrated your attention on the color, the shape, and so on.
But now I get, ask again, how is that done? Suppose someone points to a vase base and says, look at that marvelous blue, forget about the shape, or look at that marvelous shape, the color doesn't matter. No doubt you'll do something different in each case. When you do, what he asks you. But do you always do the same thing when you direct your attention to the color? Imagine various different cases to indicate a few. Is this blue the same as the blue over there? Do you see any difference? You're mixing paints and you say, it's hard to get the blue of this sky. It's turning fine. You can already see blue sky again. Note how different these two blues look. Do you see the blue book over there? Bring it here. This blue light means dot, dot, dot. What's this blue called? Is it indigo? One attends to the color sometimes by blocking the contour from view with one hand, with one's hand, or by not focusing on the contour of the thing, or by staring at the object and trying to remember where one saw that color before. One attends to the shape sometimes by tracing it, sometimes by screwing up one's eyes so as not to see the color clearly, and so forth. I want to say, this and similar things are what one does while one directs one's attention to this or that, but it isn't only these things that make us say that someone is attending to the shape, the color, etc. Just as making a move in chess doesn't consist only in pushing a piece from here to there on the board, nor yet in the thoughts and feelings that accompany the move, but in the circumstances we call playing a game of chess, solving a chess problem, and the like. I feel like I need to recall the original objection that that was too, um, yep. in order to fully grasp. I think that's key, uh, yep. But what if someone objected? Is it not true that one must already be master of a language game in order to understand an extensive definition. Is that what he's responding to? Uh, what if someone objected? It is not true. Not not is it not true? Sorry, yeah, Ooh, that was a, like yeah, you. yeah. It, it it it's not true that one must already be a master of a language game in order to understand an extensive definition. Rather, um, no. you could only guess what the person giving the expl explanation is pointing at. Um. I feel like you anticipated much of this section already. I think that is right. I just want to make sure. Uh, da, 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 da. He's anticipating, is there something about the way we point uh, that lets us communicate that we are picking out a particular feature of the thing we're pointing to? And I think it's clear this is not the case right is that right i i got the the sense that the objection is that you could just um that you could just guess in general so maybe that sure. the context isn't adding that much um but then i'm trying to figure out i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure what his response is to that uh, other than he's saying well look look at these like cases about like pointing to something's color or whatever like someone can do that and that only makes sense in with like given a hell of a lot of context like you're never sure. going to guess that's what's going on. i i think that that's that's how i'm interpreting it but that, i mean that could also be really wrong i'm, I'm not yeah. sure i'm i'm guessing like it's really intensive that it's the same section, but it's it's the same way he's giving the examples of different ways to use the word blue. Um, I mean, most things that people know, like the F-U-C-K, right? Like people use that in a good way, in a bad way, in a great way. Um, so it's 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 the same way in a, like a king in chess. You don't just move a king around a board one block at a time. It's like the crudest way to use a king. It occurs in a very, very complicated set that it makes sense to use a king, you know, one square at a time. So, um, and that's the same way we understand the word blue or any word. Yeah. I, f I feel like there's something that I'm missing in that section, but I'm honestly not sure that I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, the pointing at the paper one seems clear to me. You point at the paper and then now point at the shape of the paper. And then I'll point at the color of the paper. You're doing yeah, the same right. thing. And he's he does a sort of reductio. How is that done? Was it the point that like it's the same? Like and or maybe it's that But it's bringing back how that is a response to the to the guessing objection, right? That's the thing I'm not I'm not quite getting. Like Well, are we still doing that? Maybe he's still talking about language acquisition. That's the way I read it at first, at least, was that that 
there's no way for us to to simply figure that out outside of again pragmatic context it's pragmatic success conditions or something I should think it. I don't yeah. get all this blocking with one hand, the shape. Like I understand what you're saying. I just don't know how that works as a response. Yeah, that yeah, that's what how it ties back into the objection is a bit weird to me. And so I get the sense there must be something that I'm missing. I, I mean, so in so in trying to understand that, I'm bringing a bunch of stuff that isn't said in a text. Like, mm -hmm. well, this is all a part of language. You know, for example, um, I might give you the impression that I'm pointing to one of these other features by um, doing something non-verbally, sure, sure. you know, with with gesturing or whatever. And so it's like, look, like that's not guesswork. It's clearly, you know, it's gestured at by yeah. all these other practices. But that, but I don't know that that's the argument that's being made. Uh, just not sure. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, 34 then. But suppose someone said, I always do the same thing when I attend to a shape. I follow the contour with my eyes and feel... And suppose this person gives someone else the extensive explanation. That is called a circle, pointing to a circular object, and having all these experiences. Can't his hearer still interpret the explanation differently? Even though he sees the other's eyes following the contour, and even though he feels what the other feels, that is to say, this interpretation may also consist in how he now makes use of the explained word, in what he points at, for example, when told, point to a circle. For neither the expression, neither the expression to mean the explanation in such and such a way, nor the expression to interpret the expression in such and such a way, signifies a process which accompanies the giving and hearing of an explanation. So my, my initial thought then on that is it kind of sounds like the, it sounds like what I think Wittgenstein is saying is that there's there's this issue for the idea that um, that there's a private um, mental occurrence or something that one is brought to by um, by teaching them something like circle or something. And if if circle denotes or if if circle means this like private mental occurrence, then that sort of can't be something that is that's shared with someone else. But it can only be tracked by these public behaviors i mean i'm getting i'm getting that sense from this passage but maybe there's something else that you guys have got yeah i agree he sees the other's eyes following the contour even though he feels what the other feels that's to say, this interpretation may also consist in in how he now makes use of the explained words in what he points at, for example, when told point to a circle. Yeah. So, so after you've taught someone the word, that the way that you're going to figure out that they've they've understood is by so so maybe there is a bit of you know some things we've sort of already mentioned. Okay. Do you want to um, do thirty five? Anam, and then we're almost we're almost at the stopping point for today. Uh, thirty-five, or yeah, yeah. Okay. If you do thirty-five, uh, um, Ian can do thirty-six, and then I'll do thirty-seven. Or there, will we even do thirty-seven? There yeah, are we, we do. there are, of course, what can be called characteristic experiences of pointing to, e.g., the shape. For example, following the outline with one's finger or with one's eyes as one points. But this does not happen in all cases in which I mean the shape. And no more does any other one characteristic process occur in all these cases. Besides, even if something of the sort did recur in all cases, it would still depend on the circumstances. That is, on what happened before and after the pointing whether we should say he pointed to the shape and not to the color. For the words to point to the shape, comma, to mean the shape, and so on, are not used in the same way as these. To point to this book, not to that one. To point to the chair, not to the table, and so on. 
Only think how differently we learn the use of the words to point to this thing, to point to that thing. And on the other hand, to point to the color, not the shape, to mean the color and so on. To repeat, in certain cases, especially when one points to the shape or to the number, there are characteristic experiences and ways of pointing. Characteristic because they recur often, not always, when shape or number are, quote, meant. But do you also know of an experience characteristic of pointing to a piece in a game as a piece in a garnet? Um, I think game. Yeah, game is a, the, the spell check was the OCR. All the same one can say. I mean, this piece called the king is called the king, not this particular bit of wood I am pointing to. Recognizing, wishing, remembering, etc. There's definitely a bit of weirdness and difficulty in understanding exactly what's being said here, but the the gist that I've got from it is um, so it so in in an attempt to understand what's going on in these kind of. Um, in these kind of examples that Wittgenstein's given us, there is a temptation to look for, again, this is an interpretation, right? But because he hasn't said the word necessary and sufficient conditions, but that's what I'm sort of thinking is like, there's a temptation to go, well, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions? It, char characteristic of um, all occurrences of of this or that. Um, and he's saying, you know, there are, there are characteristic, or he'll say in other places, family resemblance, things between between them but there isn't there isn't just one right um so even if something and even if something did occur in all cases it would still depend on the circumstances um you know that is that is what happened up to up to this point um and then i i think he's doing a little less than that at least as i read him i think he's just admitting that like yeah if we want to show someone that I'm doing the name of a, uh, I'm giving you the name of a fabric as opposed to the name of the article of clothing. Like, I'm gonna, of course, there's gonna be a way you show that to a person. And that's no objection to his system that I'm gonna, you know, instead of just, you know, holding up the coat, I'm gonna maybe take a bit of it and put it in your hand. Or something right. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but he's saying, yeah, of course, there are ways we're gonna do things because of the ways, I mean, I'm adding a little bit now, but the ways our bodies are constructed, the ways, you know, we would pick out particular features. Um, his point is like, even that action uh, as a way of explaining the nature of the fabric um, or something like that uh, to for that to be an effective communication of a name, picking out the fabric as opposed to something else is going to be embedded in what happened before and after that event in right. the relationship yeah. we have with the person, yeah. things like that. And so he's saying, yeah, okay, I think he's sort of conceding something that like actually, you know, all pointing isn't just standing and putting a finger out. There are right. things that we do that help us communicate more clearly what aspect of a thing we're talking about. Right. Yeah, said, that that's, that's, that's fine. He's saying, fine. Sure. Sure. Of course it is a little more complicated than this. Uh, nevertheless, um, effective, ostensive, the, the effective communication of an ostensive definition, me effectively showing you, getting you to recognize what aspect of a thing I'm pointing out and you now learning that name is still embedded in our relationship and the things that happened leading up to that in, you know, all those right. sorts of things. When, when, I, when I'm in, in Turkey and somebody walks up to me and puts something in my hand and says a word, um, if that was my sister or if that was a person off of the street, I get totally different things, assume different things about what they mean about that word. You know, my sister is saying, feel this, check out this. Is someone else is saying, like, buy this from me or, you know, whatever. Right. You, get, you get the idea that there's yeah. these are still embedded in larger contextual pragmatic circumstances that, and that can only be me. effective in that context. Okay, do you want to do the last section? I think there's there's some stuff in a box and 36, Ian. And then we'll comment on that and wrap up. What is going on when one means the word that is blue? At one time, it's a statement about the object one is pointing at. Did I get the rendering this right? You yeah, this yeah, 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 yeah. And another yeah. as an explanation of the word blue. Well, in the se second case, one really means that is called blue. Then can one at one time mean the word is, well, that was awful. Then can one at one time mean the word is, in quotes, as is called, in <laughs> quotes, to read it. 
and the word blue as blue, and another time mean is really as is. Okay, so he's saying is and is called. Uh, can he's asking can the word is and the word and the phrase is called be synonyms, right? It can also happen that from what was meant as a piece of information, someone derives an explanation of a word. Here lurks a superstition of great consequence. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, I've definitely <laughs> I've, 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 I've experienced passage. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's you're like you're telling something about some you're telling someone about something and they think you have explained the nature of being that thing as opposed to something that's unique about this thing um you're giving someone a book and saying you know this one's oh, german I see. and they're yeah, like right, oh right, okay right. this author all ah, so Hegel german. and yeah like yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. No, no 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 like this is a this is a german translation of the lord of the rings so it's like you know yeah, like yeah. you're telling something specific about you're communicating some specific piece of information and they take it to be like a definition i don't know so this is this is a weird box um and I can say boo 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 and mean if it doesn't rain, I shall go for a walk. It is only in a language that I can mean something by something. This shows clearly that the grammar to mean does not resemble that of the expression to imagine and the like. The grammar to mean does not resemble that of the expression to imagine. So to mean is so to do... I get that oh. last point, because I think that's, again, against this idea of the picturing relation, you know, that, yeah. like, uh, that language is representing thought, uh, as in right. Locke, Frege, and yeah. Yeah, that's, I like that. And we do hear what we do in a host of similar cases, because we cannot specify any one bodily action, which we call pointing at the shape, as opposed to the color, for example. We say that a mental, spiritual activity corresponds to these words. Ha. When our language suggests a body and there is none, there we should like to say is a spirit. Yeah. This is not an account he's going to be sympathetic with. Yeah. So so I think again, yeah, that's that's just saying, I think, um, well, look at what's going on. Um, and there's this temptation to postulate propositions or the multiple uh, multiple relational theory of judgment, you know, like these judgments, and uh, I think what quite these are the creatures of darkness. Um, the essence of meaning, Nathan. The yeah. essence of yeah. Yes. What does it mean to mean and all that? Um, but but it's like just look, <laughs> just yep. look. That's not happening, is it? Um, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like when I when I do that or something, you know, like uh, the proposition doesn't just float before your mind or. <laughs> Like that's it. That's where it stops. You you yep. saw everything that happened. And now exactly. the the oh, theorizing has to just account for for that. Yeah. This was fun. Fun yeah, way to I spend a it, Saturday morning for me. Yeah, I think I think it's good. It's uh, it can be difficult in places. Um, <laughs> it's you know like what sometimes some of these like sort of aphoristic um little bits are kind of difficult to pass out and get get in context and everything but, uh, the first time i read philosophical investigations i tried to read it like pascal's pensis uh okay. i'm sure i'm saying that wrong where i thought each section was sort of uh digestible uh uncomprehensible by itself like each was a sort of self-contained statement which isn't true of all of the pensis that they're this way but nevertheless uh, this is definitely not true of wittgenstein M the more i read him, the more I see the compelling case for just doing the first 50 as a as a chunk, because okay. I over, over and over again, I've discovered that like, I to, to understand the stuff going on at the beginning of this book, I am so drawing on the stuff that I remember from later in this book. And there's no way I would have ever right. gotten that if I hadn't started reading the philosophical investigations, gave up, went and read some books about the philosophical investigations <laughs> that pulled out those late stuff and then, you know, put me back in. I mean, even like yeah. how much we read into the initial discussion of a sense of definition that came in the next 10 sections. Um, mm. That was like, right, right. We were able to do that because we'd read it through. Um, I think uh, one should, um, I, I, it totally makes sense for us to read this chunk of time and discuss it because you have to chunk it somehow. But like, we shouldn't be uh, discouraged. Dwelling too much on our 
exactly. yeah, if, if our if our um if our commentary turns out to be redundant in the light of future explanations that should probably be expected and yeah. if we like if our commentary is like a bit wrong or then we like read a bit and it's like highlights it in a slightly different way as well that's to be expected because it's all interlinked quite a lot to read Wittgenstein, one must have already read Wittgenstein. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of true, though. I, I mean, um, particularly, I, I, I mean, I suppose it's it's to be given that because because a very a very smart person spent their entire life, and this is one of the works that is like the product of that life. Um, but in order to understand what's going on, it is very densely interconnected with like biographical things in his yep. life, um, his earlier works. Can, you know the context of analytic philosophy as it stands at the time and the thought you know like the thought world that he's in it's like reading the bible or something right and trying to make yep. sense of um what a biblical author means and, and then it, you know it's just so tempting to just be like well you know my the, the sentence says this and, and not pay any attention to all this context that there's layering yeah. uh, how you should understand it can I make one more literature recommendation to yeah. uh, particularly this will be particularly uh, appropriate for Nathan. I think you I just I just wanted to comment the second message to this too. Um, but I've just been reading James K. Smith's Who's Afraid of Relativism. Um, and James K. Smith is a theologian at Kelvin College, a uh, philosopher and theologian. And uh, he's got a little chapter uh, on Wittgenstein in it. It's the second or third chapter. Um, and it's got possibly the shortest most compelling summary of the philosophical investigations i've ever read um <laughs> having really struggled with okay. this text for a lot of years uh, i've definitely wrestled with it several times and also he makes a um i mean i've got certain qualms with this book but he particularly um makes a case for why christians should be Wittgensteinian pragmatic sort of pragmatic relativists and I find it incredibly compelling, even though there's certain issues with it. But um, it's a—it's got an introduction to uh, Wittgenstein, Rorty, and Brandon in it. Um, and I just just a new book that I I discovered, and I'm still working my way through it. But uh, having recommended you know Toril Moy on this on this reading group before, um, this is even a shorter, more approachable introduction to who Wittgenstein is that'll particularly be appealing to people with religious backgrounds. Um, although I think you can read through. It, and as a, just a summary of Wittgenstein and ignore all of his comments about other stuff that and find it very very helpful so I just wanted to <laughs> throw that out there yeah yeah thanks for it um so I guess we'll do this in I mean, I'm just having a look at the calendar now for when we'll probably do the next one um probably like the 12th or the 19th whenever it, it do either of you guys have preferences? I mean, don't feel if you want to as well. Um, that's obviously okay. Also, look at my calendar quick here. But if you do have a preference, yeah, just say. Let me have a look as well. Actually, at my calendar because I think the twelfth would be better. I think the nineteenth, I'm going to be okay. Uh, gone. Okay. I can, uh, we can talk more about well, that. Well, yeah, I'm just having a look. I think I'm okay for both, so that shouldn't be a problem. Nice so let's you it, tentatively you say the 12th then. Um, Great. And just same time, okay? Yeah, sorry about just, that. Yeah. Oh, don't, like, it, that's that's fine. You know, I wasn't it, I only hang around. We can, we can do it later as well, you know, like, or if you want. It, yeah, it, that will normally work. My my family's gone, so my daughter didn't wake me up first thing in the morning, and I slept in, <laughs> and I've never right. done that in, in nine months. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Have Thanks, everyone. Day. If you're watching, Thank yeah. You. See you. Bye. Bye.